I was adopted at birth. I was adopted into a very wealthy family, and we lived in a very expensive New England town near the water. My mother was very overwhelmed with four children. My brother seemed to be striving with his friends. He was very social. Me, I was more, um, you know, one, one friend kind of girl. And uh, my sisters, they kind of hung out together. There were four of us, let's see, Leslie and Heather in that order. And uh, shortly thereafter, we got a dog, Heidi. So there were an awful lot of uh, rules and regulations. We were conservative Republicans um, and uh, everything that comes along with that. Back in the 70s and 80s, you know, there was a lot of um, elephant pants and hip huggers. I wanted to be a part of all that. My father was um, always wore a suit and tie to dinner, always dressed for dinner, very formal. Even in the summertime, when we had dinner out on the, uh, out on the porch, it was uh, with candles, um, and he would, at the very least, wear a blazer. So it was always a very formal occasion, and uh, Nancy being Nancy just didn't, um, didn't fit in with it uh, the way the rest of us did, or adapted to it the way the rest of us did. With the absence of dad going on business trips and mom kind of being alone and her trying to make her way in society, being the social light she was, there wasn't a lot of attention for us kids. I remember one of my first memories as a child was being in the crib in this room and just crying and crying and looking at the door and no one coming through it. And that was one of my first childhood memories was that crib and that door. When someone say, oh, that's so wonderful that those parents of yours adopted you, that they accepted you into their life, what good people they were. In my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, that's really nice that they adopted me. I'm very happy to have been adopted into a family. But why did my mother give me away? Why did my father not want me? What was it about me that they didn't love enough to keep me? Why did they throw me away? Who am I? My mother actually tried to take me back to the orphanage because she had found out after adopting my brother and myself that she was pregnant and she was overwhelmed with the thought of having three infants at one time. And the orphanage said that she could not return me that I was not like a merchandise. And my mother had told me this at the age of 12. So I became very defiant and very angry. When I was 12 or 13, um, I went out with some friends to go to a movie. And instead of going to the movie, we asked some men to buy us some beer and Southern Comfort, and they did. And we went up to the graveyard with these gentlemen, and uh, we drank, and the police came and arrested us. My parents weren't there that weekend, but uh, when they came home, they were just disgusted with me. Well, I knew that guy, um, he had called. We had exchanged numbers, well, he was 21. Um, and we got together afterwards and uh, we had sex. And um, I had told my mother what had happened and she called me promiscuous and very easy. It was funny because my two friends didn't get in trouble. They were like, okay, you learned your lesson. They didn't get arrested. You know, the charges were dropped against them. My father said, no, you need to face your consequences. Oh. They kept the charges against me. The two guys didn't get charged. So I was the only one that had to go stand before a judge. When I went to court, my mother was like, you know, you need to take this girl. I don't know what to do with her. They actually gave me up. They said, make her a ward of the state. We can't handle her. Back then, I don't think anybody realized the damage that had been done to this little girl who, who didn't know 
on and then to be bombarded with such labeling from her own family, from these beautiful people that had adopted this unwanted child. I went into the detention center straight from this little uptown community, high society, upper middle class, to the dregs of detention. And I was put in foster homes, and uh, they were horrible. Three or four, and probably more, and they were wretched places. A lot of abuse, neglect. You hear the worst of the worst. Well, I saw the worst of the worst. I saw it. I told people, people said, you need to be quiet. You're just a child. What do you know? I felt better sleeping in the Connons. I felt safer. One o'clock in the morning, sleeping on a bench in the Boston Commons. Safer there than I did in a foster home. I was just so lost. So lost and abandoned. And I just felt like, you know, there was nothing I could do or say. It was freezing cold, and she ran away from home and lived in subways in Boston. And I know because my father and I went uh, looking for her at night, um, down on Tremont Street, down on Dartmouth. And that was very hard for uh, uh, me and my sisters um, because uh, we were this prominent family at Hingham, and to have a member of our family act in such a way uh, was, um, was uh, uh, just unheard of. And unfortunately, then we became that family. Luke Lorenzo's here. He'll cook me a full breakfast of eggs. When I'm by myself, bagel or frosted flakes. Not very healthy, but I've got to eat something to take my medicine. And I have to take my medicine. If I don't, then the anxiety and the depression will kick in. Like yesterday, I was down for the count all day. It was just not a very good day. I can usually tell. Then I try to change my mind about the day. Today started off good, and then I got into a little quibble with Lorenzo, which automatically just threw me to the left, to the extreme. When I should just walk away, I, I engage. So I'm practicing to try not to engage. You can't change if you think that all your behaviors are appropriate. You know, if you don't see anything wrong with your behavior, then there's, then of course you're not gonna change. But I know that there's some, I need some work done on my behaviors. So I gotta get myself up and get motivated. You know, be that progress in motion. Because I say that to myself a lot. I am progress in motion. My father finally found me. Um, he had found, um, had hired a, a private investigator. My dad came down there and he grabbed my arm. And I just looked at him. I could just imagine how I looked at him. It must have been just pure hate. Pure hate looking at him, and I kicked him in the shin. And uh, he let go of me and I ran. Um, but I felt so horrible. I felt like just that horrible daughter that he had always thought I was. And I turned around, went back, and I apologized, and they threw me in the car. And sent me, sent me to a mental hospital. And then we had to go to McLean's Hospital, which um, I didn't particularly enjoy at all because there was so much uh, anger and hatred. Um, and Nancy had a lot of it, too. So it was very tough. But, you know, we went because it was for Nancy. Um, and we just wanted her to get better and we wanted her to be okay. And perhaps maybe find out the reasons why she was acting the way she was acting and doing the things that she was doing. Um, it didn't work. Therapy was hard. This guy that ran the joint wouldn't say a word. You could talk to him all night long. He'd never say a damn thing. 
My, it pissed my father off so much because we didn't know what to talk about. And one night he said, hey, we've had enough of this. We come here once a week and we come to this group and we don't do anything. You know, we've got a life. And I'm empathizing with my family for having to come in here because of me. Because I'm this person. I'm this bad person. And I remember my father standing up and saying, come on, family, let's go. We're going to go out to dinner and we're going to we're going to go have a good time for a change. And I stood up and he said, oh, no, you've got to stay here. We're not going to come back. So I get up, I go in my room. I start cutting myself. Because it hurts that bad. It was about three days later, I ran home. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, don't leave me there. Please let me come home. Please come home. I've never ran home before. Please let me come home. I begged him. I begged him. And I got on my knees and I begged and I crawled. He finally, after about 10 minutes of this, he said, okay. Like it was nothing. So, uh... We drove back to the hospital, and uh, he checked me out with a signature, and it was done and over. Um, it didn't bother me nearly as much as it bothered my parents, my sisters. Uh, it hurt them a lot and embarrassed them a lot. But then she, you know, floundered for a while and tried community college and a couple of other things, and, and then the Navy. Um, and that was probably one of the best things she ever did. My father had been in the Navy, my uncle had been in the Navy, and we had a long line of Navy people. Well, troublemaker, attention seeker, to the Air Force. Um, they didn't want me. <laughs> Uh, Navy did. Navy wanted me. Um, so I joined the Navy. I went home that night and I grabbed my, my uncle's ensign coat with all the gold and the ribbons. Took my enlistment papers and put them in the inside pocket. Grabbed a bottle of gin like good sailors do. And my dad came home and I said, well, you don't have to worry about me anymore. So he looked at me and said, you'll never make it. Boot camp was um, very interesting. Um, there were about 80 of us to start uh, in this huge, huge room of bunk beds. We all showered at the same time. We all ate at the same time. We ran with rifles. We ran miles, push-ups, everything we did. After that was all said and done, um, we dropped our number to about 60. I was told that I was going to be staying on the base and attending another two more schools. I was like, well, what's up with that? And they're like, oh no, no you're here for a reason. Um, you're going to a very uh, special squadron, uh, very elite. Throughout it, um, I strived. Um, I smiled. I loved the exercise. I loved the orders. I loved being told what to do because I knew as long as I did, what they told me to do, I was going to be okay. I wanted to be the, all I could be. I had this family now, this big, huge family, and I had this work. I had a direction. I knew who I was. I was on my way. This was going to be it. This was my career. This is all I've ever wanted, to be accepted, to be unified, to know what I was doing, to have knowledge of what I was doing, to know the direction I'm going. You know, it was all laid out. My home base was in Brunswick, Maine, and I checked in there. And uh, yeah, there were 500 men and 13 women. I was like, OK, um, I can do this. Because I wasn't afraid, because we were all comrades. This is my brethren. This is my, these are my people. These are my, my people didn't like me. <laughs> my people didn't like me at all because this was their squadron, and w this was the boys' club. And I started reading books, 
and doing these tests and passing these tests. So I ended up taking tests to become logs and records of the planes, and there were eight aircraft. And so I took the logs and records of all the aircraft, and this was a good position, usually held by a petty officer. And I held that position, and I worked in maintenance control, and I handled all the boards, and every day I'd get up and I'd do this, and I'd go in early and I'd leave late, and I took care of everything. And my chief loved me, and my commander loved me, and everybody loved me. The air crews loved me, and I loved this one guy, and his name was James Smith III and he was a cutie. And me and him started dating, and we loved each other. And it was the first kind of love I'd ever experienced, and it was great, and he was sweetie. We deployed to Spain, and when we got to Spain, um, they sent him to Portugal for, for a brief deployment. And I was left in Spain alone. This, the hallway in Spain, um, ran through the whole barrack. And uh, it was pretty pretty nice, better than the last barracks I had been in. But there was a beer machine in the middle of the hallway. And you, when I was walking down there um, to the machine, you'd put in your quarter and you'd get your little beer, your little can of beer. I remember going down there to get my beer and um, this guy popped out, this navigator that I knew. I've seen him every day. He said, hey, why don't you come in here, you know, have a beer, watch some television, whatever. So I didn't think anything of it by going in the room. Well, when I got in there, I, I, I realized there was no one else in there. And I turned around, and the door closed, locked, and I was attacked. I was raped. Um, and after he did what he needed to do, and um, I laid there freaking out because this was my brother and this was my family. This was the people I could count on and trust. And these were, this is my family and this is all, everything that I ever wanted. And this is my home and my people and this is my world. And this is my, and this is all of it. And this is everything that I've ever wanted. And this is everything that I wanted in my whole world and my my guy isn't here, and I'm all by myself, and I'm scared, and this guy's gonna kill me if I scream. And he looks at me, he says, you're dismissed. You can go now. And I stagger, literally stagger to my room as if I had drank 10 of those beers and I hadn't taken a sip. And I lock myself in that room and I don't move for three days. And I cry and I don't do anything. I don't call anyone, I don't do nothing. And I think how easy and promiscuous I was and, and what a troublemaker I am. And if I had only thought better, if I only hadn't walked down that hallway, and how could I have been so stupid? In my mind, I'm thinking, no one's gonna believe me. I'm not gonna be heard. Things will get switched around. My wording will get switched. I'll look like the bad guy. Everything will change, you know? And this was my first normalcy of my life, was the military. And I didn't want it to change. You know, I'd already been jumping around all, you know, all these years. I finally had some normalcy, and here was this chance of losing all that. James came back, and uh, I told him what had happened. I wouldn't say who. Um, he was tore up. I thought he wasn't going to love me anymore. I was damaged goods. I was so scared I was going to lose that love. And it just seemed like he loved me more. He said, let's go get married. And he took me to Gibraltar. He agreed that we'll transfer. 
we won't have to do this and back to work. And I was getting things mixed up and the multitasking wasn't happening anymore and it was frustrating. And then I couldn't have make love to my husband. And then I couldn't think, I couldn't feel good. I was showering all the time and I felt bad and things were happening to me and I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what all this was. I didn't know what was happening to me. I saw my rapist every day. I was stuck behind that counter. My rapist came in, winked at me. I jumped the counter, took a mop, and was going to take his head off before my chief came up behind me and grabbed the mop. And I went directly to um, admin and filled out a request for ma captain's mass. And I told the commander that I no longer wanted to serve in his Navy. back to Texas with my husband. My husband said, she's out, I'm out. And I uh, went to Texas, and I was going from job to job. And I'll never forget the day he bought me a dress, because I had all military clothes. And uh, he bought me a dress, and I remember crying, because he had bought me this, nobody bought me clothes. We had one credit card and we had never used it, and he did. And I was mad at him for using the credit card. <laughs> and I just broke down. But uh, I got a job with that dress. And James was going to school, working for the water company. We had it starting to form this type of life. I was trying to kind of deal, not very well, our personal, Life was kind of, <sighs> but at least we were getting the outside looking good. One day, got home, got a phone call saying, your husband um, broke his arm and you need to come to the hospital. So mad at him, I was gonna break his other arm. And I, that's what I kept thinking. I'm gonna tell him when I get there, if you, know, you broke this arm, I'm breaking the other one when we leave. And I got there and they said, did you know his friend, what his friend's name was? I said, was? And I, all I heard was past tense. I said, what are you talking about? I said, well, they were in a car accident. I said, where's my husband? They said, he's upstairs. And I went in there and he, he was asleep. And I was like, you know, honey, well, you gotta wake up now. You know, the operation's over. And he wouldn't wake up. I started screaming at him, you know, telling him, you know, you don't have to put the toothpaste on my toothbrush, you know, and, and uh, yelling at him and, and then, telling him how much I loved him and, and all that stuff and I couldn't get him awake and the guy went up to him and he whispered in his, ear, in his ear and he said, listen dude, if you don't open your mouth to put this thermometer in it, I'm gonna turn you over and shove it up your ass. And his eyes went bing! And he opened his eyes and he started looking at me and these huge alligator tears started just rolling down his face. And I swear that if he could have talked, he would have said, I'm so sorry. Three days later, I was in there with my mother in her collar and because uh, she was an Episcopalian minister. And uh, we went in to see James. And uh, we, I saw him, and I watched them turn all the lights out and uh, I'm walking out of there. and. Uh, the nurse said, is she okay? And my mother looked at the lady and she said, she just watched her husband die. And we're walking out and it hit me when my mom said that, my husband just died. <laughs> and had she not said that, I wouldn't even realized it. I wouldn't even known. 
And I remember going to the funeral and seeing Nancy, and it was pretty much at that point when she went off the grid again um, in a really bad way. She was in and out of shelters, um, really very lost. So tomorrow, I have to take a national safety course because I screwed up driving. So I, I'm already regretting tomorrow. I've gotten a ticket. Uh, too many times, so I have to go take this eight-hour course at the community college. I just, I don't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it, but, you know, I've just got to so I can work on getting my license back. But even then, I, I'm finding it difficult to drive. I get really anxious in, in driving. I'm not doing well, so I've decided just to kind of hang it up until I can get that part of the anxiety under control. But I'm also thinking of going in, in-house for a program for a month because my symptoms of, are, are getting high, a little bit higher. I always thought that if I started crying, I would never stop. So I didn't cry for a very long time because um, I thought, oh my gosh, I'll just never stop. If I start it, it'll, it'll go on forever. And, I do still numb, numb my emotions, and that's just something that I learned to do um, in the last 25 years, was I learned how to numb out and not feel emotion when I'm trying to do something. And sometimes it's a good thing, but sometimes not so good, because I stay in that numb mode. I ended up on the streets for a short period. I began shooting up um, cocaine. I called my mom, said, Mom, you know, I'm lost. Nowhere to go, I have no money. Um, I'm, I'm gonna die. Um, I need to come home, please take me home. And she said, no, dear, I'm sorry. You can't come home. And um, I ended up in a shelter. I did get a moment of clarity. <clears throat> and knew that I couldn't do the drugs. I needed to do something. Um, I signed up for um, uh, the truck driving school, and um, I made it. I made it to the truck driving school. I just, just making it to the school was an effort. And I met um, a good friend, Lorenzo, there, and um, to this day, he's still my, my best friend. We met in a, in a truck driving school in Texas. I think back in the 90s, I believe. And we, we both graduated from that school. And we went on to drive trucks commercially. She ended up taking off with some other driver. And I didn't hear from her for a little while. Then I heard from her. And she had some issues where she had some problems, drug problem mainly. I ran carpet from Georgia in a fr freezer truck out to California, picked up fruit, ran fruit up to New York to the market, and then empty down to Georgia, pick up more carpet, run out to California, ran up fruit up to New York, empty to Georgia, pick up more carpet, and same thing. And I finally, at one point, I, uh, I grabbed a partner in Georgia, and I said, I gotta stop in Texas, um, and you can catch me on the loop back around. He said, okay, that's fine. Well, he came back to pick me up in Texas while I was partying down. Got to tell you, I was just partying down. And I told him, next loop, pick me up. On his way up to New York, he got stopped, <clears throat> got put in jail. They found cocaine all along the bottom of the truck. He was arrested for trying to get, taking uh, cocaine over state lines and was under a million dollar cash bond only. To this day, he is still in jail. I called up the company to find out where my truck was coming through. They said, well, you're supposed to have been on that one, and they hung up on me. I, of course, went head straight back into the drugs to avoid those feelings of distrust, of somebody's out to get me, the impending doom, there's a contract, there's nobody cares, you know, I can't tell anyone, um, you know, who's gonna listen to me? All that came back up again. And I ended up um, staying in a horse stall. Um, 
the people that owned the horses knew I was there, um, shooting up, and I called Lorenzo, my friend, and I said, I'm dying, I'm dying, and I need your help. And he immediately brought him and his partner in that big old truck. And uh, they grabbed me from the horse stall and threw me in the back of that, that cab and handcuffed me. So here I'm going anywhere. And uh, took me to San Antonio where his mother took care of me and said a beautiful Spanish nur nur nursery rhyme to me and washed me and I cried. <laughs> that human contact that I needed so bad. And that love and that acceptance from a woman. It's beautiful. I called her my ma. She was my ma. And uh, we got to stay there for a while and I cleaned up my app for a little bit and she fed me and um, Lorenzo started working at flower shops and he'd bring flowers home to me and but it wasn't long before I was, something inside me was hurting so bad. And I was crying and I couldn't sleep and my mind would race and I was so anxious and depressed and memories of James and the Navy and the childhood and the, all this stuff and fighting and drama and these feelings of why am I, why is this happening to me? Why me? You know, this happened so long ago. Because I know now, through the VA and what they've done, that there, you know, there's a diagnosis involved that I know that there was something crazy going on and that I needed help and I reached out and asked for somebody to say, I said, look, here, there's something wrong with this and I need to find out what it is and what I can do about it because I don't like who I am. I don't like that I'm gonna jump down somebody's throat the next time they say something crazy because I go crazy and I'm gonna hurt someone or myself and I don't wanna do, do be that person. And it wasn't gonna get better, it was getting worse. Um, and they said, and, uh, but it took longer, you know? Um, with Lorenzo, uh, you know, it wasn't about getting to the VA, it was about let's get some money so we can keep a roof over our house because it wasn't about, okay, let's go to therapy now. It wasn't about that. It was about, let's get some money so we can buy some bread and butter. And how did you do that? I went and prostituted. And, uh, and how did I do that? How was I capable of doing that? By doing drugs. Because I sure wasn't going to do it clean. I sure, and Lorenzo sure didn't like the idea of me doing it, period. I just, I couldn't take any more. I had gone up into, uh, driven this little car that we had up into what was known as the Potter's Field in Texas where people went and buried their dead. They didn't have the money to bury them legitimately. I went up there, I took a hot shot um, of cocaine up there with me and uh, that's what I was gonna do. Uh, I was gonna die in this Potter's Field and that was gonna be the end and it was just gonna be over. Um, when I went to do this, this policeman that had known me for many years um, had put me in and out of jail for protective custody, um, pulled up and came to my window and just looked at me and I cried and I broke down and I cried while well, I had thrown that needle out and didn't have it and I cried and he was just like, Nancy, I've never seen you cry before. Never, I've never seen you cry. Well, you know, what's going on here? What is this? And I was like, I just, I'm done, I'm over. I just want this to end, you know? I don't want to feel like this anymore. I just remember feeling, you know, I've tried. And uh, I doesn't. I can't stop feeling like this and it won't go away. Even when I do the drugs, it's only temporary. It's for a second, but it just comes back. And he said, I swear to God, I'll get you help. I swear to God, I'll get you help. He says, I'll do it, I'll do it. You gotta find that needle. And that's the only way we can do it. So picture this, <laughs> being this big, huge cop, 
and uh, we used to call him Porky. <laughs> and he answered to it, he didn't mind. So me and this big cop, Porky, are out there looking through the grass that's this tall around, you know, shallow graves, looking for that stupid needle. And we can't find it. <laughs> it's gone. And uh, he said, told me to uh, turn around. And uh, I did. And uh, somehow, amazingly, this little bag of cocaine with just a little residue in there, that one mine, came up. And he said, I'm going to put you under arrest for this. <laughs> I go, that's not mine. He goes, I'm going to put you under arrest for this, and I'm going to ask that the court help you with your addiction. And she, you know, because she has a lot of fortitude huh, to overcome what she overcome. I mean, you know, and what they, what they say, you know, God don't give you no more than you can handle. Is that the saying? And, you know, most of the bad things I, I know I don't want to say because it's just, you know, those I like to forget. And you can't live forward if you keep looking behind you. Things started getting really good, and um, hence moving into a uh, business field and working with the, um, starting to go into the AA and the NAs and the getting the sobriety behind my back and then venturing into owning my own business and wrapping that around the AA and doing the conferences around the United States and taking that business from just a towny thing to a state thing, to a national thing, to an international recording business called Beneficial Tapes and CDs, all about A-A-N-A-O-A-G-A. -A 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 -A. I can give you all the anonymous programs. And I had 5,500 tapes or so. The woman that had the company, she made 8,000 a year. Within two years, I took that company from 8,000 a year to 102,000 a year. I kept pushing those emotions down and numbing myself out through meetings and other people's problems and the business and just kept, in, kept distracting myself. And I stayed sober and clean for six years. And I put Lorenzo to the back because he was stuck. He didn't want to move forward. He was stuck where he was at. He didn't want to change. He just wanted to stay right where he was at. And I didn't want that. I wanted the, I wanted the house. I wanted the cars. I wanted the money. I wanted to feel good. I wanted to, I wanted to be not high class, not middle class. I just wanted to be OK. But I always had something gnawing at me, you know? And people were asking me to speak. And I'd stand up there with that smile, and inside it was like I just wanted to rip the microphone away and just, oh, I just, I was just filled with grief and pain. And here I am, just one day at a time, one day at a time, and I'm like, oh my God, would this day just get over with? Oh, and tomorrow I could do it again? Another day? Are you kidding me? And I'm dying inside, and I'm crying myself to sleep, and I'm waking up going, oh my God, do I really have to get out of bed again? How many more times do I got to do this? And my mom dies. Unfucking believable. And my mom dies. And I go out of my head. I, uh, Overdosed a week or so later and uh, came to and um, started walking um, to a payphone, not realizing I was walking on um, black hot tar, Texas sun, midday. Got to the phone and I called Lorenzo and uh, told him he needed to come get me. What had happened? Um, by the time he got there, other people had called the ambulance. I was screaming, laying on the ground. Ambulance immediately took me to the hospital. 
So I burnt the bottom of my feet so bad that I wasn't going to be walking for a while. Um, I was placed on the flight deck, a uh, mental ward at the VA hospital, um, who had uh, seen me a couple of times for the depression or an overdose or so. I've always left. Um, VA? Me? You mean veteran something? Military something? No. Oh, I'm going to have it. Um, and uh, so I wheeled around in there for a month, I think. I'm not even sure how long. And uh, they put me in a, a sober program. There were other girls there, so that made me OK with it. The business was pretty much crap by now. Um, so I just figured, what the heck, I'll just go along with whatever anybody says. Just, I didn't care anymore. I just signed up um, for an information class on clean energy. So the training, I think, is like six weeks. And then they give you a um, on-the-job training for six months. Um, so that would be cool. Um, just trying to get back in the work field, but I'm not sure if it's going to get very, quite nervous at work. Even after being there for a while, something will happen. And in my head, I just make it so huge um, to the point where I don't even want to go to work anymore. It's but I want to try and fight that. I know what my past behaviors have been now after looking at it so hard that there, I, I know in my mind what, and on paper what I, it is I want to change about that. This uh, course doesn't even start for another um, two months, so I'm hoping I can do enough paperwork and coping skills to, to really do this. So I showed up to the sober house, and um, this huge guy, we're talking like six, 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 seven, opened the door, big, beautiful guy, opened his door, and he said, we have been waiting for you. Welcome. And I was like, whew, this looks like a nice place. I knew that emotionally I was very weak, and I think Glenn saw that. and. Um, and he seemed to really want to, you know, be there for me. He seemed to be. Um, he got a job, and quickly we got a little trailer, and um, we started living there. And about six months into the relationship, um, we did get married. Very, it was very quick. The next day, he seemed very off. Um, things had changed very drastically. Um, within two weeks, he started abusing me. The first abuse was I was in the shower and he had said something to me it was very I can't remember what it was but I had said something in return and he swung the curtain open grabbed me by my hair and slammed my head into the tile in the shower and I couldn't a few times and I and I was just dumbfounded that this had just happened and I ended up in the shower, I remember kind of coming to. I knew I was awake, and I was, I never lost consciousness or anything, and I remember just being there, and the water was freezing, freezing cold, and I was cuddled up in a little ball in the, in the shower, just in so much fear. So this kind of abuse started happening more and more. I called my sister. And she kind of was like, what's going on, Nancy? Are you doing drugs? And I was like, no, not at all. You know, something's happening. I don't, you know, I don't know why he's acting this way. And uh, she told my father, and my father would call Glenn, and he'd say, I don't know what she's talking about. You know, Nancy, come here. What are you talking about? I said, you know what you did. And he goes, Nancy, I never did that. He was telling my family that I was doing drugs again. I actually was still trying to do little pieces of my business, just locally. Um, and inevitably, um, he convinced me to sell the business. So now I had no income. So I was very isolated now. And then he started bringing home cocaine to me. And um, so now I was being abused. I was being kept. 
I was isolated. I did not talk to my family anymore. He was. He was t filling my family with information that was totally untrue. We moved and now we're out in the middle of nowhere. It's five miles to the nearest store. My neighbor is three miles away and we're living on five acres. Um, I start calling Lorenzo and telling him what's happening. He doesn't believe it, <clears throat> but he starts visiting during the day when my husband was at work and um, he's starting to see bruises. Now I'm starting to be strangled to pass out. Um, if his dinner's not done, he, he, you know, if it's not cooked right, I'm getting slapped. If I fight back, I'm being strangled. Um, one time I, I ran down the street after being, coming to after being strangled and um, I had grabbed his phone and called the police and they picked me up and brought me back to the trailer and they arrested both of us because he said that I had hit him and I just was like, I could not believe that it, they had arrested me. Um, so I learned to keep my mouth shut and take the abuse. So I found a little ranch that transported horses in and out of the country. And I wanted to be a ranch hand. And they said, yeah, we'd love to hire you on. Getting away to the ranch and uh, taking care of the, the horses was my uh, escape. Finally, one day, I called my brother. And I told him, I said, this is what's happening. And I need someone to believe me. And I need you to believe me, because nobody else will. Nobody believes that this is happening. He's got everybody convinced. My brother tricked my ex in a conversation. And uh, anyway, my ex admitted to um, abusing me. And my brother hung up on him and called me. And he said, I'm so sorry, I didn't believe you. And my heart, my heart, I felt so vindicated. And I felt so loved. And he said, I love you so much. Come home, please come home. Just get away from there, walk away. Just leave everything. But I ended up in Brockton VA Hospital in a program that's called the Women's Integrated Treatment and Recovery Program, which dealt with um, addiction as well as a dual, with a dual diagnosis. Um, they had um, diagnosed me with post-traumatic stress disorder as well as um, substance abuse. I met the criteria for full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder. Had this been treated directly after the attack, I would have just had some stress. If I had said something 25 years earlier, they might have been able to treat the stress from the traumatic event, and it may not have turned to a disorder. They may have been able to take care of it then. And so I'd been battling this underlying thing this whole time. That one thing, I was like, something's wrong in here. Something's wrong. I knew there was something wrong. I knew it wasn't just the alcohol. I knew it wasn't, I was, I was avoiding something. There was something in my world and I didn't know what it was and this is what it was. And they finally told me. They went through all types of criteria for bipolar and schizophrenia and um, a borderline personality disorder and, and just all these different tests. And oh my God, and they finally said, we got it. And this lady came in and she knelt down next to my chair and she grabbed my hand in just that human touch. Just that one hand touching my hand. I was like, that's all I had. Oh, I just wanted someone to touch me and hold me right and just touch my hand. And that human contact alone was just, I just, I just wanted someone to let me know that I'm still here. And she touched my hand, and it didn't matter what she was gonna say to me. 
And I was like, I'm, I'm actually a person. And I was like, oh my God, someone's touching me. And it was a nice touch and it felt so good to have somebody touch me. That I was worthy of a touch. And she said, you have post-traumatic stress. It's become a disorder. And these are your symptoms. And she handed me a sheet. And it showed all these symptoms. And I was just like, check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. And I was like, oh my God, that's me. That's so me. And I was like, okay, what do I do? Immediately, my mind was like, if I got all this, I know she's trying, she's gonna say, there's a way to get to cope with this. I'm Julie Lovely, and I'm the executive director of Wild Hearts Therapeutic Equestrian Program. And we run a program specifically for veterans that have PTSD, TBI, or MST, and it's called Wild Hearts Horses for Heroes. We start out the program um, with a herd observation. So usually what we do is we watch the horses interact with each other and how they communicate, how they establish their hierarchy. Um, we learn about their body language, and then we start with grooming. So we really, we emphasize leadership and um, building trust and establishing a partnership with our horses. If you have PTSD, or if you've been a victim of a military sexual assault, to not, to go and get help. There's help out there if you reach out for it. And, you know, that's probably the hardest part. But, you know, go out there and try to get some help. And Nancy did, and it changed her life. There have been times where I've thought about, you know, ending it, ending the pain, and, and uh, going to the other side. And the fact is that if I do that, they'll put him down, and I don't want that to happen because nobody has the time or the patience to deal with them. Um, but I don't plan to kill myself anymore because I know when I start the plan in my head, it just makes it so huge. So if the thought comes, oh, well, I'll just end it, I need to stop it from there and say, okay, wait a second, I got dogs, you know, I got to pay a mortgage. <laughs> um, you know what, my life is pretty good and I have to remind myself not to go forward to the next step of planning. Because when you get into planning, um, that's a very dangerous, that's, I call that my hot spot. Um, I do believe that there's been some form of intervention every time. So call it angels, call it fate, call it God, call it whatever you want to, but I think I'm a miracle. So anyway, I just got to face my fears um, and just keep realizing what's rational, what's irrational, what's a delusion, you know, and really think about, be very mindful about just about everything. Who am I? I'm a runaway. I'm a homeless person. I'm a foster kid. I'm a sailor. I'm a victim. I'm a widow, I'm a divorcee, I'm a drug addict and alcoholic, I'm abused and an abuser, I'm a, oh God, I just can't freaking seem to get this. I'm gonna do it this time. Mm -hmm.